Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, John. I would also like to thank the friends of MBL for inviting me here tonight. It's a great pleasure to come down to such an illustrious town and, and speak to you about the research. I'm going to tell you tonight about the research which my students and colleagues and I have been doing over the last 17 years. And this project began in a very simple way, which was I write textbooks in the field of conservation biology. And beginning in 2003, as I was working on the latest edition of my textbook, shown here, the section on climate change had kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It had gone from being kind of a very theoretical section when I first wrote this book in 1992 to becoming a subchapter. And in 2003, it was threatening to become a whole chapter of the book of conservation biology. But as I worked on this book in 2003, I noticed that there were no examples from anywhere in the Eastern United States. It seems incredible, but 17 years ago, the examples that people are always talking about with climate change were always polar bears in the Arctic, wildflowers in the Swiss Alps. They were far away examples. And I was wondering, why don't we have any examples from the Eastern United States? So Eastern United States is where so many people live. That's where I was living. It's also where President Bush was living, who was very skeptical of climate change saying it was just a theory, and until scientists had worked out the theory, the government didn't have to do anything about it. And so in 2003, I decided to stop doing my research in tropical Malaysia, and I would refocus my research at a kind of in the middle of my career and start focusing on the effects of climate change here in New England. And the idea was that if climate change is really a global phenomenon, if it's really global climate change, you don't have to go to Alaska to find the evidence of climate change. It should be right around here. And of course, you know now, I mean, there's lots of evidence for climate change, but 17 years ago, there was surprisingly little evidence for the biological effects of climate change. So what I'm going to do tonight is to tell you about what we have found and tell you some of the main results. And again, this work is done with many colleagues and many students through these last 17 years. Well, it turns out that if you're going to look for the effects of climate change, that the most significant effect is warming and that we've had a lot of warming in the New England region. So this is a graph of the temperature, the average temperature at the Blue Hills Observatory. And the Blue Hills Observatory, just south of Boston, has the longest weather records, longest continuous weather records of any place in the United States. You can see that Boston has famously variable weather, and I think Woods Hole probably also has very variable weather here. But the trend is toward warming temperatures. And the Boston area has warmed by about two to three degrees centigrade over the last 150 years. So the global average is toward a one degree centigrade or about two degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature over the last 150 years. But the Boston area has warmed up by twice as much as the rest of the United States and the rest of the world. And so this actually gives a lot of advantages for doing climate research in Boston because we've had so much warming. So we've warmed up as much in Boston already as the rest of the country is predicted to warm up by the end of the century. So it's a great model system. But also in addition to the warming temperatures which are associated with climate change, there are other factors of the environment which are also changing which we might see in the reaction of plants and animals. So one idea is that the or one thing we might be looking for is changes in rainfall. And the New England region has actually gotten wetter over the last 150 years. And also the storms are coming more intensely. Sea levels are rising, which I think you probably are very conscious of here in Woods Hole and on the Cape, that the sea levels in the Boston area have already risen by about 10 inches and they're predicted to increase by another two to three feet by the end of this century. So pretty dramatic changes there. And also CO2 levels are rising and plants are very sensitive to CO2, that that's an essential nutrient that plants need is carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And if the CO2 levels are rising, then that might change plant behavior. I'm sure all of you know in the audience why climate change is happening. It's happening because we are burning ever more fossil fuels like oil, coal, and natural gas. We're also cutting down tropical forests and burning them and releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
And carbon dioxide acts like a blanket on the Earth's surface, trapping the energy of the sun closer to the Earth's surface. And the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's like putting more blankets on your bed. And it's just making the world ever warmer as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's very clear that the world is getting warmer. It's very clear that people are causing it. So we, we can see many physical representations of this warming climate. And one example of it, you see, of course, in, in the Woods Hole area, you see it in terms of the sea level is rising. So if you look at sea level markers in the, in the harbor, the water is getting higher on those markers in successive years. But one place we see this further inland is the later freezing of the ponds and lakes in the, in the autumn, the thinner ice we have on the lakes, and also the earlier melting of these lakes and ponds in the late winter and spring. So this is a picture from Walden Pond. And at Walden Pond in Thoreau's time, the, the pond melted at the, at the end of March or the beginning of April of the year. And now the pond melts in the middle of March or even in February in some years as a result of the warming temperatures. So what our group has been doing for the last 17 years is looking for the biological effects of climate change. And we are interested in how this warming climate in particular has affected the plants and animals of this region, which we call the, the biodiversity. The second question that we were interested in is, why should we care about it? And we should care about it for a lot of reasons. So if, if, the cli if a warming climate is affecting natural systems, it means that, for example, that ponds and vernal pools dry out in the summertime earlier. So it means that amphibians don't have a place to live, that rare species of wildflowers don't have a place to live. But it also means that things like there are pest outbreaks in the forests and the forests die. It means that the agricultural systems that we're used to dry out and that we, we won't be able to practice agriculture the way that we used to. So there are a lot of very serious consequences. And then the third thing that we wondered about 17 years ago was if we discover this information, what are we going to do about it? And I think that scientists have a responsibility to try to take the information which we learn and make people very widely knowledgeable about this. And particularly 17 years ago, the government was very skeptical of the reality of climate change. And I think it's important that scientists make this information about climate change as widely available as possible so people can take some action. So climate change, again, we're biologists, we're looking at the biological effects, but there are enormous economic, social, and political consequences of climate change. And this is a map showing what Boston would look like 30 to 40 years from now if the sea levels have increased by about another two feet and Boston gets hit by a major hurricane at high tide. And this is where I work at Boston University in Kenmore Square. And this is Beacon Hill right here. And everything in between Boston University and downtown Boston will be flooded if a hurricane hits at high tide. And so we have all this area here of East Boston, South Boston, uh, the, uh, the airport right here. Uh, this whole area is going to be underwater areas of Somerville and Cambridge. Now, of course, people here in Woods Hole, you might look at this and say, that's Boston. Well, what do I care about Boston? <laughs> well, of course, I mean, Boston is the kind of a major transportation hub and kind of airport for you here. So you should care about Boston. But this same factor is also going to be affecting Woods Hole and everywhere on the Cape. This is a low-lying area. If the sea level is two feet higher, you get hit by a hurricane, Woods Hole is going to be underwater also with all your infrastructure. And also Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, I mean, Provincetown, it's all going to be underwater. and It's going to have enormous consequences. So you might not care about Boston, but this has consequences for you also. So very serious. Um, so also enormous consequences for agriculture. So this is a map showing the impact of a warming climate on the world's agriculture. And these areas shown in red are places that are predicted to have 20 to 50 percent decline in agricultural yield by the end of this century. And so you can see huge areas of Brazil, India, uh, Southeast Asia. These areas are going to be devastated because it's just going to be so hot and so dry that these places will not be able to practice agriculture. And the people there are going to starve to death or they're going to migrate out, causing major disruptions in, in the world. And so again, these are huge consequences of climate change. 
But back to what we're doing. So we, as biologists, as plant ecologists, we focus on a few simple indicators of climate change. The most important one of all, for which we have the most evidence, is changing phenology or the timing of events, particularly in the spring, so when plants are flowering in the spring. Looking at the distribution of species, so species like birds and butterflies, if it gets warmer, they could fly possibly higher up in mountains or further north. And then also on the abundance of species. Some species, just like some people, like warm weather, and these plant and animal species do better if it's warmer. But some species are losers if it's warmer. They don't like the warm weather, they prefer cold weather. So as the climate changes, we might expect to see changes in the abundance of species over time. And the key approach in this whole research area of looking at the biological effects of climate change is to find old records of something. So old records of when plants are flowering or the abundance of species or the distribution of species and match these old records with modern records. And that's what we began to do in 2003. So my students and I started going to all the little funny societies which we have in the Boston area, like the Bird Society and the Plant Society and the Mushroom Society and the Fungi Society. And we started asking them, do they have old records? Are there any old records that anybody knows about of what plants were doing and animals were doing in the past? We would go to libraries and we would ask librarians if they had any old records. We would put up notices in supermarkets and, and kiosks all around Boston. We would write little uh, notices in the newspapers and gradually people started telling us about things that they had found out or that they knew about. But of all of the records that we found were these amazing records that were kept by Henry David Thoreau in the 1850s. And this was told to us by a Thoreau scholar. Turns out the Thoreau scholars knew that Thoreau had made very, very detailed records of when plants were flowering and other natural history phenomena in Concord. They knew about it and they, excuse me, they, they knew about it and they also knew that this was going to be very important for climate change research. And so they were just waiting for climate change biologists to sort of reach out to them. And then they gave us all these records that they had copied. So Thoreau in the 1850s went all around Concord and recorded in great detail when plants were flowering and many other phenomena in this area. Uh, this is an example of one of Thoreau's tables on the right in black. So his writing is in black. You can see that he had very bad handwriting. It took a long time to figure out his writing. He all started using common names and then he changed over to scientific names. And you really have to be uh, a botanist to figure out what his names are because often his names are, are different from today's names. And so for example, we have, this is high blueberry here. So when I wrote about it in, in, in uh, blue pen, high bush blueberry, but here he writes V vacillans. And you have to be a botanist to know that stands for vaccinium vacillans which is the scientific name of lowbush blueberry. So again, this is one of his tables on the right. So this is his table from May of 1857. The numbers on the left, like 14, means that that's when he saw the first open flowers of those species on May 14th, 1857. And again, he did this from 1851 to 1858. And these were all unpublished tables that were in the Morgan Library in New York City. And so what we began to do in starting in 2004 was to wander around in Concord, Massachusetts, and look for the first open flowers anywhere in Concord in the same way that Thoreau did. We also found another botanist named Alfred Hosmer, who from 1878 to 1902 also went around in Concord, also recording the first open flowers of plant species in Concord. So I just want to emphasize to you that this is not typical for the United States. So there's no place in the United States where there's as much historical information of what plants were there in the past, but also when the plants were flowering in the past. There's no place in the United States that, that has anything near this number of records, the number of species, or the number of years. So we started making observations of things like birds with violet and lady slipper orchids, just the same way that Thoreau and Osmer did. And so these are the kinds of records in particular that myself and my graduate student, Abe Miller Rushing and I came up with. So this shows on, the, on this graph here, it shows from the 1850s to the present time, the average first flowering time 
And each one of these dots here represents the average flowering time of 32 spring flowering wildflower species in Concord. So each one of these dots here represents a whole year of work for somebody. So it's a lot of work presented in this very simple graph here. So if you look at Thoreau's records here, so these are Thoreau's years, and you can see that on average, this black cross here represents the average flowering time of all of Thoreau's years, and the plants are flowering around May 15th. If you look at Hosmer's years, the plants are flowering around May 11th, and if you look at our present years, the plants are flowering around May 5th. So even if they go to Concord today, and it looks very pristine, it looks like a picture-perfect colonial village, in fact, it's showing the effects of climate change. It's warmer there, and the plants are responding to these warming temperatures by flowering 10 days earlier than in Thoreau's time. There's a lot of variation around these average times for, for any one of us, but if you look at, for example, uh, our years right here, we have these two years right here that are just astonishingly early years, and these are 2010 and 2012. So these were extremely early spring, extremely warm springs, and the plants responded to these record-breaking warm springs by flowering in a record-breaking earlier time than in the past. So this shows very dramatically that climate change is affecting the flowering phenology in Concord, Massachusetts. I also want to mention that every time, every time we had another couple of years of data, we would write another article. So we were always writing articles about this. And because this connects climate change to Thoreau and Walden Pond and Concord, that this was always picked up by the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the National Public Radio, because this presented a very good story to tell people about climate change. And I just want to emphasize that it's really temperature which is causing these changes in the flowering time and not anything else. So in this graph right here, it's the same data, it's the same fi this figure, it's the same data, but instead of looking at changes over time, it's looking at changes in relationship to spring temperature, the temperature in March, April, and May. So this is a very cold spring, averaging four degrees centigrade and a very warm spring. And when it's a very cold spring, the plants flower very late. And then as the temperatures get warmer, the plants are flowering earlier. The blue dots here represent Thoreau's years. The uh, yellow dots represent Hosmer's years. And these uh, red dots represent our years. And so you can see that the plants are flowering early over time, and it's happening earlier because the temperature is getting warmer. So plants are flowering earlier now than in Thoreau's years because we have warmer years now. And it's not caused by anything else like temperature or changing land use. This is an interesting graph because these are, this is 2010 and 2012, and these plants, these were these extraordinary warm years, and we were concerned whether plants would still be able to respond, respond to this extraordinarily warm years by flowering ever earlier. And you can see that plants did flower really earlier. They haven't reached a point of not being able to respond to this increasing temperature. So we also try to find other data sets to find the story of, tell the story of climate change. And at the Arnold Arboretum, until recently, they had not been monitoring the flowering time of plants on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum. And so starting in 2000 and 10, we also started to, so 2000 and, 2004, we also started monitoring the flowering time of plants at the Arnold Arboretum. And after doing this for a couple of years, we realized that they had an incredible resource at the Arnold Arboretum, which is that they had an, a herbarium of dried, flattened plant specimens collected on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum. So what we started doing was matching up our flowering records with the records of when plants were flowering based on these museum specimens. So these herbarium specimens are typically collected when plants are in full flower. So this is a specimen here of, of the Vasei's rhododendron collected on May 19, 1938 from this exact same plant. So we can, we can match these museum specimens with the exact same plants that they were collected from a half a century earlier. And what you see here is that this plant was collected on May 19, 1938 in full flower, and this is the same plant in flower on this date on May 3rd, 2010. So we again can see that the plants are flowering earlier at the Arnold Arboretum now than they did in the past. What's interesting about this picture is that 
that we, because we had this mission of trying to tell the story of climate change, we took hundreds and hundreds of pictures of beautiful plants at the Arnold Arboretum with, with different herbarium specimens so that when journalists talked to us about our research, we had great pictures like that to give them and they'd be more likely to write a story about our research. We also realized after a while that Thoreau had also made observations of when trees were leafing out, trees and shrubs were leafing out in Concord. So we also began to make observations um, in Concord about when trees, trees and shrubs were leafing out. And we found that the trees in Concord were leafing out about two weeks earlier than they did in Thoreau's time. And also after doing this for more than a dozen years, we were able to say that the trees were actually responding more rapidly to climate change than the wildflowers. And the reason for that is that the trees have their branches in the wind, and so they're responding to these warm days, but the wildflowers, the soil has to warm up before the plants can start leafing out and flowering. And so it's possible that the trees, by leafing out ever earlier in comparison to the wildflowers, might start shading them out and cutting them off from the sunlight that they really need to flower and mature their fruits. And so this possibility of an ecological mismatch between trees and wildflowers is one of our major areas of study. We also found that there's other interesting data sets to tell the story of climate change and photographs are, are a great resource. And New England region is extremely rich in old photograph collections. And we've been matching old photographs of plants and flower with when plants are flowering today. But we came across a woman who had a very specialized photography collection. She, this woman collected stereoscopic pairs of, of photographs taken at historically important cemeteries on Memorial Day. Very specialized collection. And she said that of all the, all the photographs in her collection, that there was one pair of photographs which looked really different. And so she showed us this photograph on the left of the Lowell Cemetery and the picture on the right is the same viewpoint, as close as I could get to it. Uh, it's actually a building exactly where someone took that picture before on the left. But so the, the right is as close as you can get to the picture on the left. And you can see even some of the same gravestones. And you can see that the two pictures don't look alike. And what's, what's different about them? Leaves. No leaves. So the picture on the left was taken on May 30th, 1868, and the plant has no leaves. And 1868 was one of the so-called years with no spring. So there were hard frosts in March, April, May, and even into June. So either the trees never leafed out in 80, by, by May 30th, or they leafed out and the leaves had been killed by a frost. Also, this research leads us into kind of experimental work in terms of knowing how trees detect when they can start leafing out in the spring. And it turns out when you read the old European literature, they say that trees have to go through a certain period of, of winter cold called the winter chilling requirement. And then they can start responding to warming spring temperatures called spring forcing. And they also have a photo period requirement. But as far as we know, no one had ever taken these old kind of German physiological ecology uh, research experiments and applied them to American trees. So effectively, no one really knew how American trees responded to climate change. And it turns out there's a very simple way to do this, which people have started to do uh, in the United States and even in Europe in relationship to climate change. It's a very simple experiment. You just cut twigs of plants in January, February, March, and April, and you bring them into the laboratory and you see whether they leaf out or not. That way you can see what their winter chilling requirement is. And then you see how many days of warm temperatures do they have to experience before they start to leaf out. And then you can put them into different kinds of photo period chambers and see whether they in fact need long days before they start leafing out. And what you can tell from these experiments is that New England trees, just like the people, are very conservative. They really need a very long winter before they start responding to spring temperatures, spring warming temperatures. We've also started looking for bird data. Uh, we've also have been looking for bird data to see whether birds are responding to climate change and if they are responding in the same way that plants are. And it turns out there's an immense amount of bird data in Massachusetts. So many organizations and uh, uh, organizations and clubs record bird arrival times. The, probably the best data is gathered by Banamet, uh, 
uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and there they've been monitoring birds since 1970, and we've taken all of their data and we've looked at it from the perspective of climate change, and what we see is that about half the birds there are not responding to climate change. They're still coming at the same days they did before, particularly the tropical birds, because they don't know about changing climate yet, but that the Birds that overwinter in the southeastern United States and the mid-Atlantic states, they're coming a few days earlier now than in the past, so they're responding a little bit to climate change, but not as much as the plants. And you can see this in terms of potentially an ecological mismatch. So what we see is that as the climate is warming, as the climate is warming, that trees are responding very strongly to climate change. So as the temperature gets warmer, they are flowering ever they are leafing out ever earlier, that wildflowers are responding, but at a slower rate, and birds are really responding very, very weakly to climate change. So there's the potential for an ecological mismatch where the birds are not as tied into the natural cycle as they were in the past. And so ornithologists are very carefully studying birds to see about this possibility of a mismatch. But what connects birds and plants is insects, because when birds arrive in the spring, they're eating insects and feeding the insects to their nestlings, and the insects, when they emerge in the spring, they are feeding on plants. And it was very difficult to find information about how climate change was affecting insects in this region. Not so many people study insects or when they emerge, but we found the Massachusetts Butterfly Club, and the Massachusetts Butterfly Club has been gathering huge amounts of data on butterflies since 1986. And we know that butterflies are very sensitive to temperature, analyzing their data. Other studies have come out recently on uh, dragonflies and on bees, again, showing that they're very sensitive to temperature. And so they are responding to similar to plants in terms of a changing climate. It's really the birds that are not responding in this region. One thing you do, one thing that happens when you do field work is you start off looking at one thing and you start noticing other things. And what we started noticing as we did our field work in Concord was that the that many of the spring wildflowers that Thoreau and Hosmer had observed in Concord, we couldn't find. As we went out there to look for the first flowering time of plants, many of these plant species just weren't there anymore. And so a major secondary activity that we started on was to try to find these missing wildflowers in Concord. We put a huge effort into trying to locate populations of them, and many of them we couldn't find. So our conclusion was that about 27% of the wildflower species that Thoreau and Hosmer and others had seen in Concord were no longer there. And this is very surprising because about 60% of Concord is undeveloped, and 30% of it is very strongly protected. And so these species have been lost, and this and a lot of the other wildflower species which are still there have declined quite dramatically in abundance. So about another 35% of the wildflower species in Concord that Thoreau had seen had, just, had declined very distinctly in abundance. And some of this loss is due to obvious things like habitat destruction, roads, deer, air pollution, water pollution, invasive species, but at least some of this loss is also due to climate change. And we know this Excuse me. We, we know this because many of the species that have been lost are the cold loving northern wildflower species and many of the species which are very stable or increasing are the warm loving southern species of wildflowers in Concord. So we know that this loss has occurred. Also the loss is, is very distinctly tied into certain families. So families like the orchids for example, there used to be 21 native species of orchids in Concord and we were only, only able to find seven of these species. So certain species are particularly vulnerable to climate change and other factors. And also the birds and butterflies are changing in Concord and throughout Massachusetts. So we see many southern species of birds which are now extending their range into Massachusetts and many species of butterflies which are also extending into Massachusetts in ways they didn't do before. So what does this hold for the future? So 10 years ago, you would have said that the world is on track for this two degree centigrade or about four degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature by the end of the century. And of course, we're already right about here now. We've already had about a, a 0.9 degree increase in temperature. But 
because of the United States pulling out of the Paris Peace Accord and because of countries like China and India generating ever more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, that we are now actually closer on track to this three degrees centigrade or about six degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature by the end of the century, a very frightening scenario. So what does that mean for the climate of Massachusetts? Well, when I was growing up and growing up in the Boston area, Massachusetts had a climate like, like Massachusetts. Massachusetts used to have a climate like Massachusetts, but we actually don't have a Massachusetts climate anymore. Massachusetts now has a climate like New Jersey had when I was growing up. So we have a New Jersey climate. And by the end of this century, Massachusetts is predicted to have a climate like Southern North Carolina. So as John mentioned, I went to Duke and I, for graduate school, and I have many memories of lying in bed in my non-air conditioned house, just sweating and not being able to sleep because I was so hot. And that's what we're going to be facing here in Massachusetts, that the temperature is going to become like a North Carolina climate by 2070. So it's a very, very serious consequence. And also, if you're a biologist, you know that this area of North Carolina, where the map of Massachusetts is, is also the home of the Venus flytrap, which is one of the most amazing plants in the world. And by the end of this century, it's going to be too hot and too dry in North Carolina for the Venus flytrap. And what's going to be the best place in the United States for the Venus flytrap? Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is going to be the best place, or one of the best places in the United States for the Venus flytrap by the end of the century. So many of the rare and endangered species of butterflies, wildflowers, um, amphibians that we have in Massachusetts right now that we're working so hard to protect aren't going to be able to live here by the end of this century because it's just going to be too hot and too dry for them in this region. And so we need to start thinking about protecting the land for these southern species, which are going to be migrating into this area in the future. And especially something like Venus flytrap, we have to start thinking about bringing it up through this process, which is sometimes called assisted migration or assisted colonization. So the Venus flytrap, for those who have ever seen it in the wild, it's a very small plant and it has little flowers and seeds that just drop on the ground. There's no way that this little plant is going to be able to, this rare little plant is going to be able to migrate up to New England in the next sort of 80 years. It's just going to go extinct in North Carolina if we don't do anything about it. So we need to start thinking about actually actively bringing it into this region and helping it to establish in this region as the climate changes because it won't be able to do it on its own. There's some biologists who think if we try assisted migration that we're playing God or also that these species that we might be moving here might become invasive. So for example, they're worried that if you bring Venus flytraps, say to places like Woods Hole, that they're gonna start wandering around the streets grabbing small children and little poodles. That's, that's not gonna happen. The greatest danger with bringing the Venus flytrap here isn't that it's going to start kind of eating things unexpectedly or taking over the, the, the grasslands around here, the dunes. The greatest danger is that the experiment is going to fail. For those of you who are gardeners, you know that it's actually surprisingly difficult to grow native wildflower species. The reason that species are rare and endangered in the first place is because they're tough to grow. And with many of these rare southern wildflower species, it's just the challenge is going to be to get them to grow in the first place, not that they're going to be invasive. So I've told you about the main area of research that we and many other climate change uh, biologists are doing to track the effects of climate change. And there are many other areas that people think are very promising. So one area is this subject that I mentioned of ecological mismatches, and the other is also looking at the interaction between species, but the other is looking at different seasons of the year. So in addition to the spring, of course, there's summer, autumn, and winter. And we in particular, our research group has focused on autumn as a, a kind of a neglected season in climate change research. And the Climate change is also having a very big effect on the autumn, as we've discovered, that there are that the trees are keeping their leaves longer in the autumn if there's, if there's enough moisture in the soil, that birds are staying longer now than in the past, and that there are many other changes uh, in these systems. What we're investigating most intensively 
is the interaction between birds and fruits in this region uh, as a potential interaction caused by climate change. So the birds are staying longer, but actually the fruits of this area, like the blueberries and the huckleberries, they're actually happening at the same time or if anything, slightly earlier. So if the birds feed on fruit in the autumn and they're staying longer and they're eating up all the blueberries and huckleberries, what are they eating? And what we're investigating and what we think that they're actually eating is all the fruits of these invasive species like multiflora rose and bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and privet. So all these invasive species that you have all through these woods, all around Woods Hole here and all through the Cape, the, one of the reasons that these species are spreading is because the birds are feeding on them very actively in the late autumn and winter when they have nothing else to eat. And the reason that a lot of birds are, are able to stay later before migrating or birds are staying through the winter, so species like cardinals and blue jays which used to mi and robins, which used to migrate south, is because they can feed on the fruits of these invasive species. So it's kind of a, a, kind of a mutually beneficial relationship. Also, one of the things that I think that we need to do more frequently is to try to make observations of what's happening around us, which we can tie into climate change. And for me, one example of that was the opportunity provided by the tremendous drought that we had in 2016. I don't think it affected Woods Hole as much as it did the Boston area, but in, two th in, the, in the summer of 2016, we had three months of severe high temperatures and no rain for three months. And on the left, you see a cornfield which completely dried out and died. On the right, in August, the trees were, uh, the leaves on the trees were turning yellow and falling. And most of the birds prematurely left the Boston area, left Massachusetts because it was so hot and dry. And it was only resident birds like this woodpecker that were kind of coming to a hummingbird feeder to try to get a good drink. And I, and, these are the kinds of things that you can observe, that we all can observe, which we can tie into climate change. So these are the kinds of things which tell us that the world is changing and which we can then use to tell people around us, which we can use to write letters to the newspaper or write articles about, which help people to understand climate change. So this region here is not going to be affected by severe droughts as a, as a general phenomenon, but it helps us to appreciate the severe droughts that are affecting places like California more frequently. Also, these are the kinds of observations that we all can make as we go for walks and we just see things which are very unusual. So also over the last few weeks, we've actually had two temperatures. I'm not sure about here in Woods Hole, but in the Boston area, we had two days in which the temperature was over 70 degrees. And it, do we have that here? Was, it, was that also in Woods Hole? No? Maybe, pardon me, maybe not quite here because you're closer to the ocean. But in Boston, there have only been four days in the last 150 years when the temperature has been above 70 degrees in the month of January, and we had two of those this month. And that's a pretty dramatic example of the effects of climate change, of just bringing the temperatures up enough and causing a more erratic set of conditions to have record-breaking temperatures. And they also, I've been talking about climate change, but I also just want to mention that Climate change is something that you can see if you go outside, but if you go outside, you can always see interesting things. Uh, just an example of things that I'm interested in besides climate change. So I'm just very excited when I go kayaking along the Charles River, that there's this tremendous increase in the abundance of the rose mallow right now. So I guess, do you have rose mallow here in Woods Hole? Okay, I have rose mallow in Woods Hole. Rose mallow used to be a rare wildflower along the Charles River. And over the last few years, it's just increased dramatically in abundance as the uh, beetles have started to control purple loosestrife, which used to dominate these areas, and also as beavers have become more common, they've created ideal habitat for the rose mallow. So I'm going out there uh, very frequently kayaking, looking at the flowers, and doing studies of flower polymorphisms. Um, one thing which I've also gotten very excited about over the last few months is looking at rock walls or stone walls. So I'm a botanist. I always go out in the woods and I look at trees. And then one day I'm walking in the woods near my house and I'm saying, well, through these rock walls, which I've seen for 60 years, what are they doing here? And I started looking at the rock walls and discovered this whole area of natural history or kind of, you could say, landscape ecology, which has really been enriching my life over the last four four months. And so, for example, these stones right here, 
They weigh between 300 and 1,500 pounds each, and they're all arranged in a line in the woods behind my house. And it was only a couple of months ago that I said, like, what are these stones doing here? And how could someone put a 1,500 pound stones in a line in the woods? So there's a lot to learn if you go out and keep your eyes open. So for me, the main activity that I have is connecting Thoreau to climate change. So I find that, that if I tell people about kind of Thoreau's observations and connect those to climate change, it's a way of telling the story. Uh, and that's what I write about. And I tell the media about it. So this is something that, that I enjoy doing. So here on the left, I'm in Concord, and I'm talking to French television about climate change and, and Thoreau. I'm trying to be very dramatic because I imagine the French people are very dramatic. So they want, they want me to be dramatic as I'm talking to them. And on the right here is uh, myself talking to a, a group of first and second graders um, and telling them about climate change and telling them how we can use Thoreau to track climate change. And I think that it's, it's something that I think it's, it's an important thing for all of us to do is to talk to people of different ages and different backgrounds and tell them about the reality of climate change. And also, whenever I'm interested in climate change, I just go back and I reread Walden once again. So there was actually one period where I read Walden four times in four months, uh, but I read Walden at least once every year, and I look at Walden as a book which is about climate change biology. So I, I certainly think that Thoreau was a climate change biologist, um, as John mentioned. And I think also if we look at the book Walden, we read it a certain way, it's a book about climate change. So if you read the book Walden, he tells that Thoreau is telling us that, that climate is a reality and that we need to use that reality to take action. So actually Thoreau coined a word in Walden, which he, he coined the word realometer. So a realometer is a, an instrument which measures reality. And so we can actually use Thoreau's observations of flowering time from the 1850s to measure the reality of climate change today. And again, when I read the book Walden, I take three kind of key lessons from, from the book Walden, which I see throughout the book. One is the need to observe nature carefully. So Thoreau walked around Concord uh, four hours every day throughout his life. And if you go out and you observe nature carefully here in Woods Hole or really anywhere, you will see the effects of climate change. You will, you will start noticing the effects of climate change on usually warm days, uh, mild days in winter, rising sea levels. You'll see it in the early arrival times of birds, the early flowering times of plants. The second major theme throughout Walden is the need to live simply. He's always talking about eating simple food, having simple places to live, simple clothing. And he said, if you do that, you will be happier and healthier, which I think is probably still true today. But he also said you won't have to work as hard, so you'll be able to spend more time doing what you want to do. But we also can take the lesson from that that the key to dealing with the problem of climate change is also to use less resources, to produce less carbon dioxide, to produce less greenhouse gases, both as individuals, as a community, as a nation, but also as a, as a global civilization. And so... We really need to be living more simply to deal with this problem of climate change. And then the third is to affect society. So in Thoreau's time, the two great challenges that he faced and that the United States faced was the issue of war and the issue of slavery. And we, can, we still have those issues in front of us today, issues of slavery and racism, issues of war. But we also have this problem of climate change, which threatens world civilization. And we need to do something about us. And Thoreau would say to take action, try to change the world around you. So he made speeches, he wrote articles, he tried to affect the government. And that's something that we need to do today. So we need to not only act as individuals, but we need to be very active in the political process to be involved with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and other groups to try to change the political process. So that's really what I want to conclude by saying today and what I imagine that Thoreau would say, if he was talking to you today, to get involved in, in the issue of climate change. I've also tried to take all the lessons that, I, that I've talked to you about tonight and put them in this uh, book, Walled and Warming, uh, to try to reach a wider audience. And with that, I conclude, and thank you very much for your attention.
Sure. Hi. Um, I just had a comment. You were talking about the birds and that you don't really sense a, as big a change in their arrival time. And that got me to thinking that maybe the birds, their climate where they're coming from may not be changing as rapidly. And you also said that later on that the birds are staying here longer. So when you look at birds, I think you need to look at where they're coming from and what's going on there. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the, a lot of these birds are coming from Central America and um, uh, and South America, and, and they're responding to the climate down there, and particularly the, the movement of the um, – uh, uh, kind of the weather patterns down there, which are not as changing as much. Also, when the birds are flying up the East Coast, they are, they're not just responding to temperature, they're also responding to wind direction and, and rainfall. So if it's a rainy day or it's a very windy day, they're not flying. So, so in contrast to the plants around here and the insects, which are responding primarily to temperature. Um, thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation. Yeah. I want to ask a question about the, uh, the, the first of the two uh, graphs that you have. Uh, the one with the data from uh, the Equator and the one with the data from Right. So is this the one you're pointing to? Is, this yes. one? Right. is, there, is there global warming going on? That would explain the 40-degree shift in the beginning. A four-day shift? Yeah, I mean, at 1858, right. there was enough uh, carbon being thrown in the atmosphere, so you would expect that, that change to occur. That right, so... so but, but why is the change then over the longer period not larger? Okay, so, so this is this is... We could probably talk for hours about this one question, but the, what, during, during Thoreau's time, the, at the end, Thoreau lived at the end of a period which was called the Little Ice Age. So there was this unusual period of about 300 years uh, and that was in which the world's atmosphere was unusual, the world's climate was unusually cold. And so Thoreau lived at this, this very, the end of this very cold period. People during that time were very concerned with cold weather. They were concerned that if the temperature just got a little bit colder, that they wouldn't be able to practice agriculture, that the growing season would be too short for agriculture, and that they would freeze during the winter. And right now we're concerned with very warm temperatures and, very, and whether high temperatures will actually kill crops in the field. So Hosmer lived in a, from the, so the period from Thoreau's time to Hosmer's time the world was emerging from this little ice age, and that was causing some of these, come some of this kind of warming temperatures and the plants responding to it. And then from Hosmer's time to our present time, the, the atmosphere has been warming because of the uh, increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Question here. Uh, in the introduction, you had mentioned you'd also looked at uh, mushrooms, and then you. I wonder if you found anything out. You didn't return to it in the lecture. Yeah, so uh, we, we talked to people at the Boston Mycological Club, um, and uh, my wife and I are both members. Um, great club. Should all join it. Uh, but we couldn't find any good data. So they, they have all these records where they go out and they record all the mushrooms they found in a certain day, but they go to different places. And, you know, so it, it kind of wasn't really something we could make sense out of. The one place where there's incredible mushroom records is in, is in England. So in England, there are clubs that have unbelievable weather or records of mushrooms. And what they're showing there is that uh, mushrooms are coming out earlier in the summer um, than they have in the past, and that they're also staying much later into the autumn than, than they did in the past because of the longer growing season. So that's, that's um, you know, so there are some good studies showing that mushrooms are responding to climate change but not here in Boston, or not here in New England. I just had another comment. Oil was found around the beginning of the Civil War time, and I don't know if that affects 
if that affects the change from Thoreau to Hosmore at all, because oil was used beginning then more greatly than the whale oil, I believe. Right. So, I mean, you know, there are a lot of reasons why the climate is changing, but the really, the biggest, the really, it's, it's thought that the, that the point at which the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere really started to affect the climate were really in the 1980s. So people started, the industrial revolution started, people were burning coal, oil, and natural gas, but the accumulation in the atmosphere was not really sufficient to really start impacting the atmosphere very strongly until the 1980s. At least that's what the, the current thinking is. You, you mentioned uh, invasives increasing, and I wondered if you had any comments about that. I, I've lived in Falmouth now almost 55 years, and I've seen incredibly um, new invasives and, um, and just others flourishing. I haven't really seen many disappearing. Right. <laughs> but but you, do you have any particular comments about what invasives are showing up in Concord? And, yeah, so and, the subject of invasives is a very interesting one. Um, so I think that there are many factors of the environment which are changing. And so a lot of these invasive plants have been around in New England for a long time. And they've only become, started to become invasive in the last few decades, very dramatically. So there are many things which are changing in our environment here in Woods Hole or in the Boston, really throughout. So you have the temperatures are getting warmer. There's also increasing amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, which some plants can take advantage of. There's also increasing nitrogen deposition caused by the increased burning of fossil fuels. So when you burn fossil fuels, it results in this atmospheric particulate nitrogen, which then gets in the soil, creating more nitrogen there. There's also more non-native earthworms in the soil. So there are all these things in the environment which are changing. And at some point, a lot of these non-native plants that were there, suddenly the conditions became much better suited to them than it was in the past. One species that I remember in particular is the black swallowwort. So when I was a college student and I learned black swallowwort for the first time, it was this plant that was hard to find in the Boston area. So it was mostly this kind of non-native plant growing up on hedges in city areas. And now black swallowwort is just, it's just exploded in terms of how abundant it is and it's invading lawns. And you never saw that, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. So a lot of species are, these not certain non-native species are able to take advantage of these, you know, conditions which are, you know, which, which weren't here before and to really change their fundamental biology. Garlic mustard is another example. Garlic mustard was in New England, you know, for 150 years. And it was just this like little funny plant often founded in vacant lots, often where there were like, you know, a lot of people walking dogs and things like that, extra nitrogen in the soil. And then garlic mustard suddenly about 30 years ago transformed into this unbelievable invasive species. So I think that a lot of these species are taking advantage of the altered climate. But some species can also disappear. So we're actually in this phenomenon now where purple loosestrife, which used to be so invasive, is actually now collapsing in many areas because of a, of a, a biological control beetle, which has been released to eat it. You have clearly um, added to the scientific body of knowledge um, uh, behind climate change. Um, would you dare to um, give us your thoughts on what we should do about it and something beyond eliminating the consumption of fossil fuels? How do we do this? How do we take constructive steps to solve the problems that you've clearly outlined? Well, I mean, I mean the first step towards solving the problems is, is to really recognize as a country that it, that it is a serious problem. One of the, the difficulties is that the government right now in the United States does not take climate change seriously. And so I think we have to get involved in the political process and start talking more to each other, people who are very skeptical about this, and get people to as a country to take this very, very seriously in the way they do in European countries, the way they do in, in Japan. I mean, until that happens, it's very difficult to imagine doing anything. In terms of what we need to do, 
I mean, there are whole books and encyclopedias and departments of, of engineering which are addressing these issues of climate change. And I think you're probably all have a, are aware of these things and have read about it. I mean, we need to move toward renewable energy and less use of fossil fuels. Um, we need to lower our consumption. We need to eat less meat. We need to uh, have more energy efficient vehicles and transportation systems. Um, so these are all things that we really, you know, need to be doing. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're massive undertakings, but we will only do them if people at an international level perceive there to be a crisis. So we can individually do things, so we can individually lower our thermostats, have smaller cars, use electric cars, but until it's really done at a national level, at an international level, it's not going to make any difference. There are also these various ways people have considered of, of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere um, using engineering methodologies, so we're seeding the atmosphere with, with particulate matter. So people are studying all these things, but it's really only going to be happening if we have the political will to do it and they're willing to spend enormous amounts of money. Question here. I used to live in the Concord area and I'd go walking through Great Meadows and along the path. And if you just step over a little bit into the water, there, were, there, was, this, there was a lot of purple loosestrife, but there was also this, I think they were called water chestnuts and they were real prickly. And I wondered if those are really, if they have a, um, a, an enemy or if they are proliferating like crazy. Because I do remember purple loose drive, especially if you're driving, what was it, down 2A? Right. And on the left, there was this huge field of them. They were beautiful. And I remember commenting to a friend, isn't that beautiful? And she said, that's not beautiful. <laughs> right. So, I mean, purple loose drive is an astonishingly uh, beautiful plant, uh, but it's also very invasive. I mean, it's a, it's a perennial plant which produces thousands of seeds every year. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's a very beautiful, but also very invasive. And that's a species which, you know, it's an example of what you can do if you're lucky to find the right biological control agent. And there were these actually two species of beetles that were found in Europe that, you know, you, that are very easy to propagate, very easy to breed, and you can release in huge numbers and they will control purple loosestrife very effectively. But water chestnut, I don't think there's a control agent for water chestnut. I think people just try to harvest it, which is kind of marginally successful. Um, actually, in Great Meadows, they removed the um, purple loosestrife, and now there's American lotus, which is invasive in this area. It's, it's, it's taken over the areas that used to have purple loosestrife. So you remove one invasive, and you get another mm -hmm. invasive uh, in its place. But along the Charles River, you have this happy situation where the purple loosestrife has been removed, and it seems like the, uh, this beautiful rose mallow, this native hibiscus species, um, is taking over. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, this will be our last question for the evening, but Richard will be in the lobby to sign copies of his book. So we thank you for coming, but this is our last question. I'm interested in, um, you talked about ecological mismatches, and one chart you showed, a graph you showed, showed how plants are blossoming earlier, but the bird migrations are on a different track. I thought that migration was triggered a lot by a photo period as much as temperature. So I started thinking, of, well, the birds get here and the plants have already flowered and their typical food sources have maybe already passed. So I wonder how global warming is affecting migration patterns in relation to food sources and things like that. So a very, very active area of research is how climate change is affecting birds if they're not responding as much as Plants, but right. So birds, birds are migrate for, for a lot of different reasons. But I mean, certainly they respond by photo period, um, which would actually kind of make them a little bit more slow to react to climate change rather than temperature. Um, so lots of people are are interested in whether there's a mismatch between birds and the insects that they're eating, because if the birds are arriving later and the insects are coming out earlier, then maybe they won't get as much food to eat or as much food to feed their nestlings. They will miss this big pulse of insects. But it's actually surprisingly hard to study what birds are eating. So birds, it's kind of hard to watch what the birds are eating. It's, it's, it's hard to actually distinguish those insects. So people are trying to get good at identifying insects from little body parts or using DNA analysis. But it's, it's, pretty hard. It's, it's actually very hard and not very satisfying research. People pu published a few early papers on these of like uh, European flycatchers and, and what they're eating. But... People are now starting to question these studies. There are a little bit these studies which are a little bit too good to be true. 
and people are really looking for better studies. Very, very hard to do research on this. The kind of research that we're doing actually on the, the, what birds are eating uh, in the fall is actually surprisingly easier research to do it because you, you at Manimut, they catch the birds for banding. And you catch the birds and you put them in bags and then they sometimes leave a deposit in the bag. And then you look at this deposit and you can see what kind of seeds that they're eating and the seeds are just passed through the birds. And so there you can actually see whether there's a mismatch between the, the birds and the fruit that they're eating. So earlier this evening, uh, I met someone who asked what the talk would be like. And I said, well, it's uh, Walden and Thoreau. Uh, so it's going to be somewhat comforting um, and contemplative. But also with climate change, it's going to be a little frightening. So thank you for a contemplative, uh, inspiring, and frightening talk.